screen. <clears throat> So this evening, um, I am joined tonight. So my name is Dr. Colleen Ehrlich. I am the president for the Colorado Association for the Gifted and Talented. Um, and I am also the principal of Holstrom K-8, which is the Adams 12 five-star school district um, magnet school for gifted and advanced learners. And so I'm joined here tonight talking about acceleration with Dr. McKinney, who's going to also be introducing herself. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Rebecca McKinney. I am currently the Director of the Office of Gifted Education with the Colorado Department of Education. Um, prior to that, I was the Director of Gifted Education in Denver Public Schools for five years, and I spent 10 years there in their gifted department. Uh, parent of two gifted kiddos and super excited to be here with you this evening. Excellent. Thank you. So I think um, Dr. McKinney and I, we kind of live and breathe giftedness on all sides because I am also the mother for, of two gifted children. Um, and between us, our four kids, we have, um, you know, the high achieving gifted, the twice exceptional gifted. And so uh, we, we come at this not just um, as educators and experts in the field, but also um, as just parents. And so this slide deck, uh, we, you know, when we were talking about what would be our conversation with CAGT, we, we wanted to kind of talk about acceleration, but in a different way than it's been talked about in other conversations with CAGT. Um, and so this is a little bit of like an overview and things that you might consider when, uh, you know, promoting acceleration as an intervention for gifted learners in your district. So we do have a QR code there. You can go ahead and use that QR code and then you can access this um, slide deck. And then later we also have that same QR code. So if you don't catch it this time, don't worry. So we just wanted to begin the conversation with um, grounding um, in a quote. And so our quote is from Dr. James Borland from the Teachers College at Columbia University. The quote is, acceleration is one of the most curious phenomena in the field of education. I can think of no other issue in which there is such a gulf between what research has revealed and what practitioners believe. And just kind of lifting up that um, a lot of the elements that we're going to be talking about in this presentation that um, you know, we're gonna be going through some of the research, we're gonna be going through some of the misconceptions and um, that this, this is the kind of elephant in the room, so to speak, that there's, there's still this gulf behind what, um, what we know and what practitioners believe. And so then how do we as advocates begin to bridge that gulf? Mm -hmm. I'd like to add this, this quote is from 1989. And so thinking about the research at, at, at that time in 1989 was so vast in support of acceleration. And now, and some of the research we'll share later on in this presentation is much more current. Um, it still continues to support the use of this intervention for our gifted kiddos. Um, so first really want to look at beginning by defining what acceleration is. Um, as it's used to support gifted learners. Because um, today we're hearing a lot of similar terminology um, used in reference to catching students up from like the learning that was missed during COVID. And so we wanna make sure that today's session, we're really focusing in on the term as it's specifically used um, for our gifted learners and um, the way we use it here in gifted education. So in the most basic of terms, acceleration really is about moving faster through the curriculum. Uh, one of the um, seminal um, research articles on acceleration, A Nation Deceived, which is from 2004, defined acceleration as an intervention that moves students through an educational program at rates faster or at younger ages than typical. That means matching the level, the complexity, and the pace of the curriculum to the readiness and motivation of the student. And that's really important that you're very intentional about matching that um, intervention to the individual student. Um, and they also note that acceleration is educationally effective, it's inexpensive, and it can really level the playing field 
between students from our more affluent schools to our schools um, that serve our um, students that receive free and reduced lunch or, or are needing um, uh, financial support. The National Association for Gifted Children also has a position paper, which we have linked later on and I'll show you um, when we get there. It talks about academic acceleration and it adds important nuances to this general definition um, by really highlighting that educational acceleration is one of the cornerstones of exemplary gifted education practices with more research supporting this intervention than any other literature on gifted individuals. So the practice of educational acceleration has long been used to match the high level students um, abilities and their talents with optimal learning opportunities. So it's really the cornerstone of what we do in gifted education. So acceleration is a very broad term that's used to encompass a variety of different options that we use to support our gifted learners. We can group these options into two kind of main categories. They're either grade-based or content-based. So we think grade-based, that's like whole grade acceleration. Content-based is like, you know, we're gonna go, um, we're gonna accelerate in specific content, reading, math, science, for example. But one of the things that we wanna make sure we point out is that when we're thinking of either grade-based or content-based, it's not either or, but it's sometimes and, right? So for some students, two or more acceleration interventions or options might need to be layered on one another to ensure that effective instructional supports are in place for that individual student. So let's take a look. Here are the many different research supported types of acceleration that can be used to support gifted learners. A lot of us are very familiar with whole grade acceleration, single subject acceleration, um, but there are a lot of different options. Mentoring, credit by examination, AP, distance learning courses, a lot of different options for our kiddos. And I'm not gonna go through each of these today. We have links to all the resources where you can go in depth if you wanna explore one or more of these types um, on your own. But one thing we wanna know is not all types of acceleration are appropriate for all gifted learners. Um, and you know, Colleen and I mentioned that we both have kids. One of my kids needed really intensive whole grade type acceleration for my other child, that wouldn't have been the right fit for her. So I think it's important to make sure we continue to mention that there's a lot of different options and they're designed to be able to be flexible so that we can meet the individual needs of all of our gifted kids. So I'm gonna turn it over um, to Colleen, who's gonna talk a little bit about some of the misconceptions that we hear um, in the field. Right, and so <clears throat> I love this picture. So misconceptions is kind of talking about that elephant in the room. And, um, you know, Rebecca and I, when we were building this presentation, we were laughing about, you, sometimes you gotta <clears throat> know what the elephant is and jump on top of it and give it a good, um, you know, right around the room and see what what is actually happening in the thoughts and the beliefs of those people around us, right? <clears throat> so if you just go to the next slide, we're just gonna go, I'm just gonna quickly kind of go through a couple, but I think that, um, you know, in the research that Rebecca has already shared, as well as she, um, after this, she's gonna go a little bit more in depth, and then we're gonna talk about how, how do we, how do we use these? And I think ultimately, um, in being a school leader and being a parent and being an advocate for gifted education, that, uh, you know, the misconception piece of anything, it's always, <clears throat> comes with a level of frustration for many people. We get frustrated that how are how are these like beliefs around a unique group of students still hanging on? And you know, like Rebecca said, that one quote is from 1989, and it could have been from 2022. Um, but ultimately, these misconceptions are really, really important for us to know as educators and parents and advocates because. If we can try to figure out where the beliefs of those people are around us, what they're actually believing, then we can then we can work to move those beliefs. And that takes time. Um, but if we know what the belief is, then we can then we can work to um, to ground it in actual like research and fact. 
Um, at least that's the goal. So a couple of these, um, acceleration is socially harmful for students. Um, acceleration puts unnecessary pressure or stress on students and students will struggle to connect with older students. I think we started with some of the more commonly known misconceptions um, and what we know through research. And again, um, Rebecca will take us through just some more specific pieces that like this couldn't be more true. And I think that sometimes that intensity that comes along with gifted kids um, in that second one, especially can almost, uh, you know, be used as an excuse of, well, like think about how intense they are already and how much stress and pressure they put on themselves already. And so what happens if we like give them even higher expectations? Um, and so I think part of that is also though, but what happens if we don't, right? And then also, I think that any educator is going to say, we're, we're not just like throwing them in the deep end and saying, I hope you learn how to swim, right? And so the, the supports that are in place absolutely need to be there as well. On the next page, um, acceleration is for um, highly or profoundly gifted learners. I, like it depends on the acceleration, right? And that's why that's so important. Um, this the anecdotal one is really interesting. Well, like we've tried it before and it didn't work. Like we tried it with a third grader once and you know it wasn't it wasn't right and so therefore like it's not good and we're not going to try it that again. Um, and I think the next one being a school leader myself is um, kind of just speaks to the competing demands of a system that acceleration is complicated and complex. And that whole idea of just like the com competing demands and like essentially I don't have the time to figure this out right now or I don't really know enough to be able to figure it out so then therefore it's even more complicated and complex to me because I just don't know enough to be able to do it. Um, and then it's better to go deeper than faster. Uh, and you know as a as an educator as a principal like yeah like we do want depth we want depth we want complexity we want problem solvers we want critical thinkers we want all of those dots to be connected just not at a not just at a concrete level but an abstract level and so yes we absolutely want the depth and sometimes we also have to up the pace so i think that talks to what um rec was talking about before is that all of those different ways to accelerate a student they're not an or they're an and Right, um, and you have to know your learners because sometimes depth is going to be enough and other times that pacing absolutely needs to be addressed. Um, an acceleration policy takes too much time and resources to develop for just a handful of students. Yes, we will talk about this one more, but I think that that one just really gets down to like, um, Either I don't have like the knowledge base, which ultimately is not educators' fault, because you know if we talk about skill versus will with students or educators or anyone that that gifted education or even take gifted out of it, like advanced academics, is not something that is a part of really any teacher prep program, and certainly not any. Um, principal preparation program. And so ultimately, people might not just know. And I think that there's a whole lot that can be done within acceleration. Um, you know, that's pretty cost effective, not having to hire more FTE. Um, and it's just about helping those leaders understand where that actually is and how do we as advocates like join them and support them in that. Um, and then accelerating one student creates an unwanted precedence, right? Some, some educators and school leaders are, if I accelerate one, everybody's going to want to do it. And then I have to tell all these people no, and then it's going to hurt our relationship. Um, and so we'll talk about that as well, because it is very important to have a policy that guides you. Um, the idea that acceleration can create gaps in student knowledge, right? Especially if they're um, content accelerated to where they are, um, where they're skipping over standards. And so, yeah, assessment is a huge piece of that. And then also it's not, again, um, you know, throwing them in that deep end to swim on their own, but how, how are we supporting them? And if there is that knowledge, then how are we giving it to them? Because we're talking about this group of kids that just learns at an incredible rate. And so more than likely they are, <laughs> You know, they're those kids that seem like they can put their hand down on a book and like they know what's in the book and 
the educators are sitting around being like, but we didn't actually do anything to show you that. So they're making these leaps on their own. Um, <clears throat> and then accelerate, acceleration in reading and writing is not possible. So again, right, there's all of those different types of acceleration. Um, and it might end up being that in your system, depending on the system, you might full content accelerate in math and then reading and writing might be done more in like small group and classrooms. So it's just about knowing the system and knowing the different types. Um, and, the, you know, these next two, I think, kind of go together. <clears throat> that acceleration is elitist and that acceleration is an equity issue as it serves white affluent students. And I think, you know, both Rebecca and I got involved in gifted education through the lane of equity um, and how, how do we not just change people's thoughts about this, um, these last two, but how do we, how do we as educators and advocates work to um, make sure that that's not the case, right? So where does acceleration fit into gifted education and where does gifted education fit into equity? And if we have data that shows that in a school or in a district that it really is, that any type of programming is only servicing white affluent students, then we, like any other educator, need to take a step back and say, then, then what do we have to do? How do we make sure that that's no longer the case? And so we'll be talking about that a little bit later as well. Yeah, that goes into that policy piece and having a policy that's guided by a clear equity lens to ensure that we're not creating unnecessary barriers for students who do need acceleration. Um, and again, creating a policy that allows various options for acceleration. So it's not just grade skipping or nothing else, right? So it's that and not either or. Um, so we're gonna spend just a brief time um, talking about the research. We have links to where you can get most of the research yourself. Um, but as you know, and we, we mentioned before, the research around acceleration and gifted kids is abundant and there is a lot out there. Um, and it's so uniformly positive, supporting the benefits of appropriate acceleration. Um, it's kind of unbelievable. It's difficult for us to really find information and research that talks about negative impacts of acceleration. Um, so I think that's one important takeaway to think about is how much research is out there and how positive it is. Um, so when you get the QR code and you get our presentation deck, there is a link if you click on this National Association for Gifted Children icon or the Acceleration Institute at the Bell and Blank Center. They both have links to their research, their information about acceleration and gifted. Um, so one thing that we're talking about a couple of just specific studies, right? So there's one study um, of high ability children that showed 71% reported satisfaction with their acceleration experience. And you're thinking, okay, 71%, that's not that high. But then they talked to those students who reported that they weren't really satisfied. And the reason they, the majority of them were not satisfied is because they wanted more acceleration, more options for this. So it wasn't because they didn't like the acceleration, they just felt they needed more. So Maybe they needed, again, that layered approach um, to acceleration options. Um, and accelerated stu students in research have been shown to outperform non-accelerated students academically in the long term. Uh, and I will share a study here in just a minute, but um, mathematics students who skipped a grade were even more likely to obtain graduate degrees, publish, or receive patents in science and technology areas um, than their non-accelerated um, mathematics students. Um, and Colleen talked about the concern, one of, uh, one of the first misconceptions about the impacts of social emotional well-being um, on the, and potential uh, negative effects of acceleration. Um, and that's really an argument we hear a lot, that it might be harmful to the student's self-esteem, that they won't fit in, uh, but research tells a very different story. Research on acceleration has demonstrated multiple academic benefits to students and suggests that acceleration doesn't harm students. Um, there's no evidence of negative impact on social and emotional development either from the research that's out there in the field. 
um, specifically students who participate in early entrance, or as we call it here in Colorado, early access to elementary, were on average six months ahead of um, in achievement when compared to same age peers at the same time of year. Um, they, had, they actually showed improvement in socialization and self-esteem compared to advanced students who were not accelerated. So as we think about those early access kiddos and the benefits to them um, potentially of acceleration. Um, and then finally, researchers noted that students who participated in whole grade acceleration didn't differ from their peers in the ability to interact or form friendships with other students. Again, that social emotional piece that we're so concerned about, that we hear people are so concerned about sometimes, really the research doesn't support any of that concern. Um, and as we think about our gifted kids. So again, when you get our deck, you can click on these two icons and it will take you directly to the link um, for that research and some more information on, on that. So you guys can dig in deeper. And here's just a recent study. Um, this was a longitudinal study published in the Journal for Educational Psychology um, from Vanderbilt's study of mathematically pre precocious youth, whose findings were released just here in 2020, find, found that there were no negative effects in the long-term well-being of gifted youth from academic acceleration, such as grade skipping, graduating early, or a combination of the educational pl advanced placement methods. So any combination of acceleration. Um, so again, there's a link to that the entire study here. So you guys can dig in more if you wanna read a more recent study. Again, like, our like we mentioned, our first quote was from uh, 1989, right? So we've got decades worth of research that supports this work um, as the cornerstone for gifted education. So both the National Association for Gifted Children and our own Colorado Association for Gifted and Talented both have position papers on the subject of acceleration. Just like before they're linked to the icon. So if you just click on either one of those um, logos, you will get to directly to the position statement that each organization has shared. Um, I'll share just a few statements from each that we wanted to make sure we highlighted. So the National Association for Gifted Children states that acceleration options should be available at each stage of development in a child's educational program, from early entrance to primary school, up through early college entry in order to even out the curriculum challenge for our gifted kiddos. They go on to say that acceleration decisions should be made thoughtfully with the needs of the whole child in mind. So as we think about that in decision-making, we need to think about the appropriateness of a particular form of acceleration, the extent of the acceleration for that individual child at that given time. Educators and parents need to consider the child's intellectual and academic profile, their social, emotional, physical development, and preferences and dispositions of the child relative to the decision to accelerate, because um, it may not always be an appropriate option for every kid. And so again, Finding that right fit for the individual child and their individual needs is important. Um, and then CAG-T shared the benefits of acceleration in their position statement, stating that acceleration benefits many gifted learners by better motivating them towards schooling. I think Colleen and I both in our careers have seen a lot of gifted kids and even my own, <laughs> my own where school didn't fit. And so then school was a struggle for, for a very gifted individual. Um, who has a lot of potential, but school was not a, a good place for them because it didn't match their, their needs. Um, so it can also enhance their enrollment in extracurriculars. It can really give them challenging options and it can pre prepare them to be contributing members of society at an earlier age, which a lot of our gifted kids are ready to do great things early on. Um, so again, there's clear research findings to support the positive outcomes of acceleration. For gifted learners. Um, and so now we're going to turn our attention to some considerations of how to effectively advocate for and support acceleration um, in your setting. Thank you. Okay, so let's go through some just general considerations now that we know some of the common um, misconceptions and some of that research that is out there. Um, and just a side note, it actually was pretty funny trying to research neg like negative um, outcomes for acceleration um, because we weren't really able to find any, which that in itself I think is super telling. 
Um, but yes, considerations, let's jump into that. Okay, so <clears throat> just a, a couple of considerations, pieces of advice where it might fit in. I think um, ultimately first beginning with asking questions of others to understand their thinking and then the origins of that thinking. And so um, kind of like what we were talking about with the misconceptions, <clears throat> if somebody um, is, doesn't understand acceleration or um, is kind of pushing back on the idea of acceleration. It's it's good to know those misconceptions and to have some of those kind of guide the questions that we ask, so that then we can understand which misconception or multiple misconceptions they're holding about acceleration, because that then can um, essentially inform our advocacy, right? And then within that, obviously, for yourself, understand the research and um, your specific state and district policies. And it could be that when you start to dig into it, your state doesn't have any policies or your district might not have any policies because I think that's just like an important piece with gifted um, education in general is that it's not federally mandated um, to the point that, you know, there's that there's one definition. And I think ultimately what ends up happening with that is like your state could have a very different even definition of what gifted is than you know where Rebecca and I are in Colorado. And so um, it, it's, it starts even with like the definition, how is it defined? What are the policies? Um, do you have a policy for early access or are there other things on the book that books that might make that very, very difficult? And so then you can kind of also look through all these different ways that you can accelerate and start to say where might be a starting point if you um, if you don't really have anything going yet in your state or your district. <clears throat> um, another huge piece, and I know this is like um, Rebecca and I are huge advocates of this, that acceleration is one piece and only one piece of gifted education and all gifted education exists layered onto a foundation of first best instruction and high expectations for all, right? And so um, just even knowing where does the gifted education and program in your school, in your district fit to the general education piece, um, because ultimately, um, you know, we also fight other misconceptions just within the field that, well, we don't have any gifted kids in the school or we don't have any gifted kids in this district. Um, and then, you know, that that whole saying of that bigotry of low expectations, try as we might, I mean, it still is plaguing certain parts of the of our public education system and beyond. So then how do we make sure that those high expectations are in place for everybody from the very beginning? And how are we working with general ed in all ways to just make sure that all of our kids are getting the very best instruction because a rising tide really does lift all boats. Um, and then that kind of then also ties into that equity piece of it's not saying that um, we have all of these great things that are only provided to kids once they hit a certain benchmark. Um, a lot of what we do in gifted education in terms of strategies absolutely is appropriate at varying levels of depth and complexity for all students. And there's also research there. And so, um, you know, it might be that in your system, you can't jump right into acceleration, but then how are we building in the expectations? How are we lifting all of these students up so that we have more students who are then are in need of acceleration? And then when we talk about acceleration, like, how are we actually talking about it? I think um, one of the big pieces for, for me is that we need to start connecting it to some of those general education terminologies, because ultimately it is an intervention. So we should be calling it an intervention. And like any intervention that is provided to a student, it needs to be based in like data, right? So what data do we have that shows that this intervention is needed for this individual student? And then how do we progress monitor that, that intervention to make sure that it is having the effect that we want on that student's growth, right? So in this case, we're saying that in order for a student to grow, to, to come to school and learn something new every day, which is every single student's right, that they need some form of acceleration. And so then therefore, how are we progress monitoring 
that acceleration as a formal intervention, right? And then therefore it could be, um, you know, that through that progress monitoring that it is found to be a great fit and it's working, you know, and I think the other piece too, just with that kind of mentality of progress monitoring, like let's see it and like, you know, you know, try it on and see how it fits, so to speak, that, um, you know, parents and students are more likely to be like, yes, this works for me because I know that I'm not making some huge decision that I can't back out of if all of a sudden it's not, right? And so there does need to be that flexibility. And why shouldn't there be? Because there's there's flexibility in pretty much every other type of intervention that we provide for students, right? So I think when we start making those comparisons, um, people who don't know gifted education, because again, they were not trained in it, they start to, like, they understand what intervention is, they understand what progress monitoring is. Um, <clears throat> Like we said, keep equity considerations at the forefront, include that culturally responsive um, instruction. We'll talk about that also when it comes to creating policy is like, how do we, how are we keeping that equity in the forefront? Um, not just in acceleration, but again, in general education. And then within that gifted education, because ultimately when we talk about equity, um, and again, something that Rebecca and I very much agree on, that idea that you can't have an equitable education system without having a strong gifted education and advanced academics programming. Because we know that one of the worst things that kind of happened with No Child Left Behind was that focus on that mere proficiency. And so those students who were already proficient were like, okay, you're good but they weren't because they weren't growing and learning every day, which is what we want for every single one of our kids. Um, and then another huge point that goes um, hand in hand with that equity is that your acceleration policy pathway, whatever you would like to call it, um, that there needs to be multiple entry and access points throughout a student's educational journey. So it is not that oh, we're gonna give you this one test in first grade. And if you are hitting this cut score, then congratulations, you're going to be accelerated for the rest of your life. And if you didn't hit that, that there's no way that you're gonna be accelerated. But, you know, the, the analogy is always between just children and flowers. Flowers bloom at different time as do kids. And so what happens to that student where everything starts to click in third grade? Right. Um, and so having there be that multiple um, access points and entry points. Um, and just that it's imperative to have process um, to have a process and policy that is grounded in research. And so, um, again, at the end of this slideshow, we will share um, the QR code again. So you'll have access to this slideshow. But this is just um, a really great, helpful um, paper that was created developing academic acceleration policies. And that's from NAGC um, and just kind of helps you think through all of the different things that you would want to think through to make sure that you are developing um, an equitable policy um, that is grounded in research and just um, ideas and thoughts to consider, as well as that idea that Rebecca was talking about as well, that even when you have a policy, you have to keep it flexible enough because each one of our gifted learners is so unique, right? So that idea that if you know one gifted learner, you know one gifted learner. Um, and so even within that policy, each individual case has to be approached uniquely. And then we have a couple of links in there. So there's the Iowa acceleration scale. That's like that more like paper and pencil. And it's, and it's nice because it helps just educators think through all of the different um, aspects of, you know, a human being to look and see where they are within acceleration. And then the Bell and Blanc Center just came out with the integrated acceleration system, which um, has been talked about in previous conversations with CAGT and that's like an online system, which is nice because, uh, you know, if you use it, then it comes with professionals to help guide your team as well, especially in some of those tricky cases. But, you know, it really does help you um, just approach each student as an individual. It takes into obviously um, the data, the academic data. Um, it takes into, uh, you know, uh, it, it talks about physical size and it talks about 
if they get accelerated at grade level, are they going to have a sibling in that grade level? It talks about 2E students and things like that. And so um, that is something that I've used as a principal. And even the principal at a gifted and advanced academic magnet school, we um, primarily do do a lot of um, content acceleration, particularly in math, but we also do full grade accelerations, which I also think is, um, you know, a thing that people think, well, we don't full grade accelerate because we're in a gifted school, but I mean, an outlier is an outlier. And so based on data and who that student is, if full grade acceleration for them is what is going to help them learn something new every single day, then that is what we're going to do for kids. And so I think that um, that Iowa acceleration scale has been really nice. I think, you know, in talking about each student as an individual, especially for some of our students who are twice exceptional, like I can think of one student, um, we were accelerating him from he um, he joined our school in sixth grade. And at the end of sixth grade, um, we um, you know, pulled a team together and went through the acceleration process with him. And um, it was interesting because it was his mother who said, well, like I'm a little concerned about some of the social emotional effects um, because he struggled. He was twice exceptional, um, highly gifted in math and science and also um, autistic. And he, um, he, he struggled socially, right? And so she was like, I don't know what this is. What are the, what are the impacts of this going to be? And the question really became, if we don't accelerate him, is it going to help his social emotional needs? Um, and if we do accelerate him, is it going to hurt his social emotional needs? Um, and then we, when we kind of phrase it like that, um, and then the team, including um, the student and including the parents, because they are absolutely part of that team, um, we're like, yes, let's do it. And it was um, just a really amazing success. And he's actually going into a sophomore year now. Um, and so I think that, you know, it just helps you think through some of those things as well, especially with some of those students who are twice exceptional, because it's not, that's not meant to be a limiting factor. That's just a piece of who they are. <clears throat> So as we wrap up today, I know we kind of went through a lot of stuff very quickly, but we tried to make sure that there were a lot of links in our presentation so you can get to access to this information and dig deeper um, as you would like to. Um, but we're gonna kind of close with another quote. Um, and we always like to think about how we support our intellectually gifted learners within our school systems. And we often hear arguments against acceleration, a lot of the ones that the misconceptions that we share, right? Um, yet we see acceleration happening in our school system without any pushback or fear that often arises when we talk about acceleration for gifted kids um, in that academic setting. Um, I think specifically think of athletics, right? We have that freshman who's on that varsity basketball team. And why are they on that team? Because they have the skills and the abilities to play at that level. Um, and so now think about that gifted reader who's denied it, that opportunity to have access to higher level reading class because of their age. You know, they're a fifth grader uh, or they're a five-year-old, so they can't possibly be reading and understanding Harry Potter, right? And I think back to To Kill a Mockingbird when the teacher, Miss Caroline, tells Scout to tell her father to stop teaching her how to read because Scout was just so far above and beyond what the teacher was prepared to um, support her with. Um, and so often this is how our systems react to gifted learners, right? Um, instead of allowing them to learn and grow every day, which is what we want for our students, um, we're kind of stifling them. So the importance of thinking through and having a solid acceleration policy um, and practices that help support our individual gifted learners is um, very important. So we should strive to stretch our gifted learners and um, acceleration is a great research way to do that. So um, thank you for joining us this evening, Colleen. I don't know if we have questions that we should answer or could answer, but here's our QR code to get access to our slide deck again and our contact information. We do have another slide that just has a lot of research linked to it. We won't show it here, but um, we have it available um, for, for you guys when you access our presentation. Yeah, and we do have just one question right now. From Alana McKinney, um, maybe it's your long lost cousin. <laughs> um, does the state of Colorado have a position on acceleration? Uh, so 
we have a lo- Colorado is a local control state. So typically we, we um, allow, we have each individual district or what we like to call them as administrative units. Um, they set their own acceleration policies. So individual districts would have um, their own policy on how they approach acceleration, if that makes sense. Yeah, but I think what it is important to note is that we are, um, the state of Colorado is uh, pretty highly regarded for the policies that are in place at the state level for gifted education. So we do have um, gifted education mandated at the state level, um, which, you know, as you go through and become more familiar with just different states throughout the United States, that that's actually not the case for every single state. And so, um, but then what's left up to that local control is, um, you know, the, the like how to some of the programming, which would then include acceleration, which is why it's so important in the state of Colorado to know what, um, like, what are your policies and or if they don't have policies, then um, reaching out to those districts that are similar to yours and or in the same area to kind of see how they approach that as well, because there's some um, you can learn quite a bit from. Yep. From and one thing I didn't mention, Colleen, was we do have early access to kinder and first grade as part of our state gifted rules, um, but that is an optional part of state rules. So again, administrative units, Um, districts get to decide whether or not they're going to offer early access. um, And that is kind of codified within our rules. It's a very, very um, well-defined subset of kids that's that that's targeting that based on state rules. But again, districts can have different policies and things like that if they want to do early entrance, for example, and not early access. So there's a lot of different flexibility being here in Colorado um, that local control allows us the opportunity for districts and administrative units to really meet the needs of the individual kids that they serve. Hey, Rebecca, really fast. Can you go back to the very first slide? Because I guess on Facebook, our pictures are actually hiding that QR code on the last page. So if you take us back to the very first page, then I can be able to access that. And while she's doing that, I think, you know, knowing that, um, that Colorado is a local control state and knowing that, um, so many of those different policies are created at uh, at that local level, then it makes advocacy even more important, right? Because um, we know that a lot of um, educators and educational leaders don't have a lot of formal education around meeting the needs of gifted learners. And that is no fault of their own, right? And so then um, ultimately we become educators through our advocacy on why, like why are cert- why, like why is the research for acceleration so strong? Why is it considered one of the best ways to provide an intervention for gifted students that is cost effective? And so, um, you know, ultimately it just, it provides us a solid opportunity to partner along with those people around us to um, understand what they're thinking and then you know, make life a little better for, for gifted learners, right? While just supporting education in general. So I think that we don't have any more questions. Um, but just want to thank everybody so much for joining us here this evening and um, that we we have sincerely enjoyed the time. And if you guys have any questions and definitely please don't hesitate to reach out and um, the QR code, if for some reason you didn't have a chance to grab it or it was not working for you, then just let us know and we'll be happy to send you this, um, this slide deck. All right, and with that, we're gonna go ahead Rebecca, if you could stop sharing your screen fast. And thank you guys so much for joining us. Have a wonderful evening. Take care. Bye.